welcome him to talk to us about uh, virtual reality and other things. Thank you. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Again, a great pleasure to be here at ASCII 2080. It's, it's my first. I have been asked by Nick Paris to give his apologies. He was cursing when he found out that I was presenting here, because apparently it's the first time in five years that he's actually not been uh, to ASPE. But you'll see some of the work that we're doing with him and all the, all the equipment and technology that we're giving him free of charge, which I noticed in the, in the previous speaker's slide. So my name's Bob Stone. Uh, I've got a very weird post in that I'm actually a psychologist and human factor specialist by training. I work in the Department of Electronic Engineering at the University of Birmingham, and I deal with virtual mix and augmented reality. Uh, and you'll see some of the examples of this in, in a little while. I say weird because it's one of those things where people ask me, well, why are you not in psychology? Why are you not in computer science? And actually, I'm glad I'm not. Because one of the great things about working in engineering or in an engineering faculty, particularly when it comes to projects in defense, healthcare, heritage, education, is you've got this multidisciplinary approach, these great guys who will actually help you solve problems. And more importantly, put up with the crazy ideas that I have on a weekly basis and actually bring them to fruition. So it's one of the great things about being involved in, in a little group like this. We were established in 2003, if you can word, use the words established. Um, in fact, I go back longer than that. My, my first uh, sort of venture into the virtual reality came in 1987, courtesy of an experience at uh, NASA in California, which uh, certainly changed my life. So we've got 30, 32 years of experience in VR, AR, and more recently, mixed reality, and I'll come on to that in a second. Um, not, just in, not just in these te technologies, but specifically from a human factors focus. And we also have the parallel areas of what we call telepresence and telerobotics. So we're a very small team, very small team. There's about three of us, hopefully with the fourth one to join quite soon. Focus, as I say, is on human-centered design and human factors. Hopefully that'll become uh, obvious as we go through the presentation. And we are very active in healthcare. I've been involved in the healthcare uh, area for simulation and human factors since 1992 as a result of some work that we did over in Salford and with Manchester Royal, which I'll touch on again in just a second. Heritage, education, and defense. I think that's our big strap line at the bottom. Uh, and for those of you who know me or, or see some of my rantings and ravings on LinkedIn, where I'm, I'm particularly well known as Captain Grumpy, uh, I'm actually quite dead against things like faculties, hubs, centers, institutes, and organizations, because history shows, I'm afraid, they deliver very, very little of impact that make real, real impact to real people doing real jobs in the real world. So one of the reasons why, when I went to the university and was asked to set up a virtual reality center, I basically said no, flat out. I said no to actually establishing a virtual reality degree, because they're unfortunately proven they're not worth the paper they're written on. We're on the road all the time. We're going to places like Torbay, we're going to places like Withenshaw, we're out actually taking all of our knowledge that we've built up over the last, well, I say last 30 years, let, let alone the more, the more recent uh, projects, and trying to show people the benefits of, of what, what actually works and what doesn't. And I carry the mental and physical scars and the gray hairs of having trying to deal with very skeptical people uh, in, in, in the dim and distant past. So what do we do? I thought I'd just give you a quick whiz through, uh, because obviously you think people talking about simulation, virtual reality, mixed reality, sometimes as if it's, it's, it's not been around for very long, but it has been around for, much, for a very long time, certainly since the 80s and certainly be, before then. But since, uh, certainly since um, I've been involved, we've been, we've been involved particularly in healthcare, we've been looking into this thing called serious games, which is a term that I don't particularly like. Um, but it's basically using gaming technology uh, in order to deliver virtual reality for simulation-based training. And I think that's a key to why people are getting very, very excited about it now. Ten years ago, the kind of things we're doing today would have actually cost a quarter of a million pounds graphic supercomputer, £75,000 for the software, not let, let alone annual maintenance costs. Today, the software's free. We're doing it on £1,000, £1,200 games laptops. And it really is making a difference in terms of affordability and accessibility. So we've experimented with games companies on trauma training for, for casualty-based surgeons, surgeons who are going into operations who haven't experienced the kind of trauma that they like to face, but don't want to be taught the basics, but need to be taught the procedures of trying to rescue individuals' lives within four to five minutes. Post-traumatic stress disorder and serious games. Again, this is something we tinkered with as courtesy of funding from the, the Ministry of Defense, but it wasn't particularly successful, unlike in the States, where this is actually big business, particularly with uh, some of the groups like Skip Ritzo's group at the University of uh, Southern California. Uh, trying to convince defense psychologists, psychologists and psychiatrists that you can use this technology has, for a variety of technical and human factors reasons, been very, very difficult, many of which I actually agree with. 
Virtual scenes of nature, virtual restorative nature, again, no time to go into this in detail, but we have been doing a lot of work in terms of trying to get scenes of nature into care homes, hospices, hospices and into intensive care units and hospitals in order to encourage or to, to support the cognitive restoration of people who are undergoing recovery from traumatic operations. And we've been doing a lot of work, for example, in the West Country, which is one of the reasons why uh, we, we involve ourselves with Nick et al., building scenes of nature, coastal scenes of nature, and sort of uh, rural scenes of nature, and trying to bring these into uh, people in, in the city areas who cannot or will not, uh, through no fault of their own, be able to get out and experience this kind of thing. And we've tried this uh, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, where, which is our, the, the so-called super hospital, quite close to... Uh, Quite close, to, quite close to where I work. Uh, we've been trying a restorative environments and, and virtual environments of nature with uh, military amputees. The good news is, of course, now that military amputees, the source of our participants, has now dried up, which is great news for, uh, for, for the healthcare of our armed forces, but not so great news if you're looking for participants uh, to get involved in these projects. Um, we've also been looking at using um, restorative environments for impact on sleep quality. And uh, I've been uh, co-supervising a young lady called Charlotte Small, along with Professor Julian Bion, uh, in ICU at Queen Elizabeth, and her PhD is, has just been submitted, and she's about to have a viva within the next uh, next couple of uh, next couple of months. You'll see these you'll see pictures similar to listen to previous previous uh, speakers talk. Not sure I'll get permission to children, but never mind. These things happen. I'll be having words with Nick. Don't worry. Uh, virtual scenes of nature. We've been taking this further now, in that the scene, the, the actual studies looking into the impact on sleep quality weren't particularly successful for a variety of reasons. But we're using the same environments now, in order to encourage people in intensive care to undertake sort of motivational exercises uh, using these scenes. So, for example, on the left of the picture, you can see the, the Motomed system that we've modified uh, in order to provide uh, individuals the ability to pedal, both using their hands and their feet, using a hospital Motomed system, using basically a 45-pound cadence sensor that you can buy from Amazon. And, and then on, on subsequent days, you're competing with your previous day's, your previous day's performance. The bottom of the left-hand side, you can see one of my colleagues operating a, a digital spirometer. And what he's actually doing is we're looking at working with GI surgeons to encourage diaphragm and lung recovery by getting these guys to actually control, would you believe, a medieval, tre medieval trebuchet, which is basically lobbing rocks at boats in Plymouth Sound. And we can adjust the elasticity and the range at which these rocks are flying. What we've been doing is we've been experimenting with these quite, quite thoroughly at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and these are all being written up now. And then what we've been doing is, because I come from Devon and I'm completely biased, I've been, we've been then giving our technology to Nick for him to be able to integrate it and, 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 and look at the, the differences of integrating technology between a, a major city hospital and a rural hospital such as the one at Torquay. We're also, we're also, um, we got, to, I've got some very, very, I'm very lucky to have some very, very talented students. Uh, and uh, over the last uh, last couple of years, we've been working with a company called Wavelength VR in in London uh, to look at the possibility of using virtual reality as a means of supporting children with chronic pain, not just from a distraction point of view, uh, but from a whole experiential point of view, getting them to empathise, for example, with cartoon characters. I don't know if you can just make out on the left there that little buzzy bee there. He's, he's actually a mentor in one of the demonstrations that we're. To be trialing with Nick down at Torquay, uh, hopefully sometime towards the, the middle of December. We should have this garden quest, as we call it, uh, finished by the end of November, ready for initial trials. On the right, we've got something called Candyland, which was originally developed uh, for, to, to support my wife, who is a special needs teacher, and um, one, particularly, one particularly young girl who is uh, at the far end of the autistic spectrum. But we're now developing that as a means of supporting children and distracting children during uh, bandage changes and uh, injection interventions uh, as, as a means of distracting them from the pain that they're getting. And the, one of the most recent uh, developments, which, is, which made me very proud, one of my students, Elsa, who you can see in the top left-hand corner, is we've been working with an uh, end-of-life and palliative care specialist called Sheila Poppert. Some of you may know her. Um, she provided us with some narratives for two scenarios, one of which we've actually developed into a mountain scene. So, so it's a 10 to 15 minute mountain scene which goes from day to night with all kinds of effects such as the glowing embers of the fire, fireflies, uh, the aurora borealis and what have you. And you can sit in this just listening to the wind, listening to some very soft music. And uh, we were thrilled just about two months ago to hear that David Attenborough, so David has actually um, given his voice to, to actually provide the narrative from a student's project. So we're hoping again this is something we'll be able to put out for uh, initial usability evaluation trials in the next uh, in, in the next um, the next uh, month or so. 
So that gives you an idea of our sort of pedigree and heritage, if you like, with regards to uh, simulation and simulation-based, not just training, but, but experiences for patients as well. So I come on to the main subject of, 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 of the presentation, which is the mixed reality side of things and how that's influencing the way in which we're developing a new uh, medical sort of emergency response team trainer, primarily, but not exclusively, for the, the, the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine. So what is mixed reality? Everyone's got their own idea of what mixed reality is. If you, if, you, if you look on YouTube or you look on LinkedIn or you look on any social media site, you will see crazy, daft pictures like this. Now, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to pull any punches here, but these are complete and utter rubbish. This is not mixed reality. I'll come on to the, what the definition of mixed reality is at the moment. But at the moment, it seems that everybody thinks that by putting on a Google Glass or by putting on a HoloLens or by putting on a Magic Leap, all of a sudden, you've got the ultimate intervention support device for surgery and all manner of healthcare activities. Nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. None of these pieces of equipment from a human factors or technical perspective are currently fit for purpose. And, and, and that's, very, that's a very, very critical thing to say. There's, a lot of them have got promise, but if you look at the way in which these, these, these um, pieces of equipment are advertised on the web with computer-generated imagery, animated videos to go with them, it's unbelievable. The amount of time it's going to take for these things to get through into actual operational service and surgeries and, and operating theatres is going to take a long, long time. Now, I've just heard, we've, you may have heard that the FDA has recently approved the use of the HoloLens uh, in some kind of surgical setting. Now, I can tell you now that if I found that there was a surgeon who was going to approach me wearing a HoloLens to do surgery, I would get out of that operating theatre faster than the, the anaesthetic would take to actually take effect. They are not fit for purpose just yet. They're promising, but what we're trying to do is this. This is exactly why we do what we do. Put the, per, put the, put the human first and bring, put the technology very, very much second. Okay, so we spend a lot of our time giving independent, qualified advice based on case studies, of which we have plenty, to show people that it's not just a case of buying these things in and all your human interface problems will be solved or your training problems will be solved. It's not that. It's not been that for the last 32 years that I've been involved in. It's getting better. I don't, not gonna, I'm not going to pour cold water on everything that's coming out of the web. It's, not, it's getting better, but there's so much hype out there at the moment. I'm not, I, I don't believe in the Gartner hype cycles, by the way. They're a complete waste of time. They are completely not indicative of the, the current state of affairs in technology-based training, particularly when it comes to this technology. I have a version of Gartner hype cycle. It doesn't just go to the trough of disillusionment. It goes, I, my version actually goes down into the chasm of despair. Um, and, 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 and normally, when, when, you, when you try to creep out of the chasm of despair, you don't come back up onto the, the whatever it is, the plateau of whatever the hell it is on the right-hand side. You come back up. You come back up on the other side. And these technologies have been going up and sliding down, going up and sliding down, literally for the last 20, 25 years. But it's all about putting humans first and technology second. And I think Bryn will probably agree with me that, that, that it, we, we've got to make sure that human factors forms a central part of this technology if it's going to stand any chance of being used uh, and, and taking, taking into consideration the capabilities and limitations of the end users. To, to appreciate this, I, again, I'm going to go back into history. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to put a, a firm foundation on this so you didn't suddenly think that what we're doing with this medical emergency response team trainer project is, is, is science fiction or, or it's nice to do. It is grounded in human factors, fact and human factors basis. And this all comes very briefly from work that I did with uh, a guy called Rory McCloy, who's a gastrointestinal surgeon at Manchester Royal Infirmary, back in 1992 onwards. Um, some work we did for the European Union on mastoidectomy and... Um, and um, uh, being able to, to, to look into cochlear implantation, and some of the work we did for the Human Factors Defence Technology Centre between 2003 and 2012. So back in the 1990s, laparoscopic surgery was one of these new technologies that everybody thought was an absolute miracle worker, and people were getting on board, and people were trying this out without really being trained. Uh, and there was the, the, and the, the actual press and the media got hold of this, and there were a number of very, very high-profile litigations, litigation instances where people were experiencing debilitating injuries, debilitating um, interventions caused by very, very poor training. And it's hardly surprising when you see what these people were actually asked to train in. The basic training was using dolly mixtures. The intermediate training was using grapes. Grapes are great because they, if you squeeze them, they splat, and, it, and, and you can actually then pull the, pull the skin off. The advanced trainer was then chicken. And the problem with this was that when you'd gone to the advanced trainer, it was kind of judged then that you were, a, that you were then more or less confident to go in and operate on a patient. Uh, there were no objective metrics, no objective data to support your level of competency based on putting these things into an Ethicon endobox. 
So to cut a long story short, over a number of years, uh, and, and, and basically as a result of one afternoon in an operating theater doing human factors observation with this guy, Rory, we developed something called MIST, MIST VR. And you can see on the right-hand side there, this is one of the uh, so what we call the perceptual motor skills training to you for particularly for um, sort of for, for uh, operations uh, involving sort of hysterectomy. And we work closely with Rory. We work closely with Alan Farthing, who you know is the the, the, the royal gynaecologist. Uh, but the importance about this thing was we were able, as a result of spending time in the operating theatre, to be able to decompose all the tasks this guy, guy was doing into those symbolic images that you saw on the right hand side of the screen. Okay, and then to make the actual experience, training experience more believable, we used instrumented instruments, if you get my pitch, uh, to make the activities that the, that the training surgeon was going to do more realistic. So in other words, we were not displaying something that, we, that they should already know about, what the cuts, triangle, the liver, the gallbladder, gallstones, etc. To do that would have cost a phenomenal amount of money. We were training the skills that that guy needed to transfer from open surgery into, into keyhole surgery. But make those psychomotor skills, make those very simple sim symbols relevant by using real world looking or real world feeling equipment. I think it's a testament to the human factors that that system was on sale, not that I ever made a penny from it, sadly, but between 1997 to around 2010, it was actually on sale and marketed by a company called um, Mentis in Sweden. The other project I wanted to mention briefly was temporal bone surgery, mastoidectomy. And one of the things, again, spending time with, uh, with, with Richard Ramsden, the ENT surgeon at Manchester Royal, we were able to, again, to try and break this down into fundamental skills. It wasn't so easy with this because the skills and the feedback and the operating theatre environment in which this guy was working was much more complex. So what we ended up doing was, again, a form of mixed reality. The graphics were actually quite simple, but the equipment with which the trainee would work were based on commercial off-the-shelf COTS surgical equipment uh, or replicating surgical equipment. So we have twin phantom haptic feedback, uh, twin haptic feedback devices, which you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, a pair of what were called virtual binoculars to create the stereoscopic view that these individuals were using when they were when, when they, got the way they were drilling through the uh, the mastoid and the uh, and the inner inner bone. And the great thing about this was these phantom haptic feedback devices not only gave you the vibratory feeling of going through different densities of bone, they actually made the sound, a fairly accurate sound of how the drill or the or the bird changes as you're going through those, through those those bones. And then a couple of descent examples because these all feed into the final part of the or the second half or the second quarter of the uh, fourth third fourth you know, quarter of the uh, presentation. I'll get it right. I didn't come to the guard dinner last night, so, this, this, so there's no excuse. You see, there's no excuse for me to make these mistakes. Helicopter voice marshalling. Um, now this is a, an example of training youngsters who are who are will be going on the back of, in this case, uh, Bell Griffin helicopters out of Shawbury or some of the Sea Kings, as used to fly out of, uh, of St. Morgan down in Cornwall, and their task is to verbally relay the external situation to the pilot, particularly during areas where the helicopter is coming into a very confined area. To do that, again, simple graphics conveying only the cues, the depth and distance and textual cues and the object cues that were required for the training to take place, but do that in the context of something that approximated a helicopter's side door. So you, on, the, on the left, on the left, yes. On the left, you can see one of the trainees here actually holding onto a physical handhold, which is what he would do in the back of the helicopter. He, and as he, as he looks outside of that door, he can see, for example, the submarine from which they have to, have to, they have to evacuate a casualty. When he moves his head inside, courtesy of the tracking system for the headset, he can see the internals of the, um, of, of the helicopter. So again, very, very simple mixed reality. Let's, let's build something that's, that helps the trainees believe or makes the virtual reality a lot more believable. Similarly, with close range training for the Royal Navy, what we did here was we actually used inert weapons. When we did the analysis on board, these guys are slewing the weapons in the main using their own physical bodies. Now, to replace that with somebody in a headset and somebody with an Xbox controller was complete nonsense. So the idea is we would use these inert deactivated weapons, so they had to put their effort into slewing the weapon onto the target when it was approaching their ship. And we also used the headsets that, not, that, that were actually didn't enclose their entire face. It gave them some degree of peripheral view so they could see their real hands and their real arms and feel the actual controls. And, and, and that also helped with uh, instances of, of simulation sickness as well. Same with the, uh, the larger weapon, 30 millimeter, where we had to, because, because of the quality of the headsets, it was impossible for this guy to actually resolve a virtual reality recreation of that control panel. So again, by, able to, by him being able to look down and see the control panel, then he was able to interact physically with the equipment. So these are all mixed examples of mixed reality. 
We've got the uh, voice marshalling, close range weapons. There are others, for example, the, we, we did a, a minigun train for the Royal Navy, the cutlass bomb disposal robot that is used by the current armed forces. <laughs> But they're also, importantly, all examples of the importance of adopting a human factors, a human sense design approach from the beginning. So a lot of our experiences are contained in the left-hand document, again, which is quite old now, 2012, but I still use it in the human factors teaching that we give at the University of Birmingham. And importantly, uh, one of the most readable standards that are out there, ISO 9241 Part 210, the ergonomics of human system interaction is, is what I say to my students, is the absolute Bible for introducing interactive technology into simulation-based training. And I'm not going to go into this in great detail. I haven't got enough time, but this is, a, this is a version of the flow chart, the process chart that you'll find within ISO 9241. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll illustrate some of this using the Medical Emergency Response Team Trainer project that we've been working on um, over the last, over the last two, two and a half years. So here we are. Medical Emergency Response Teams. These are the guys that are sent out in... Uh, Obviously, you'll be familiar with the guys coming out in Chinook helicopters. It's not exclusively Chinook helicopters, as you see a little bit later on. But these are the guys who are, who are required to perform primary casualty care in between the point of, of extraction of the casualties right back to, and, and keep these poor guys alive, and no matter what their conditions, and some of them, as I'm sure you're aware, are absolutely horrendous before they get back to, camp, well, originally Camp Bastion, and a more adequately, more satisfactorily equipped hospital. So... We were, asked, we were approached by the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine to look into the possibility of using VR, AR, mixed reality, whatever, in terms of can we now take this technology, is it mature enough to be able to provide some alternative to the way they train now? So, first steps, plan the design process, understand where this is going to be used, who is going to be using it, and what the knowledge, skills, and abilities, and characteristics of your end users are going to be. So, we spent some time with the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine, who came up with this list of challenges. Can we provide something that's more cheaper and more transportable, or cheaper and more transportable than what they have at the moment? Top right-hand corner, top right-hand image, you can see a 100,000-pound wooden box. This is what they use currently at RAF Rice Norton and elsewhere. Completely immovable, only, in, only representative of a Chinook helicopter. Can we provide an option that's got overall better training quality, better training fidelity? Now, please note, this is not designed, this is not designed to train clinical skills. This is designed to train the experience of conducting those clinical skills whilst in operational settings. So it's a kind of a pre-deployment trainer uh, not for, for individuals who have already gone through the main clinical skills that are required uh, for, rescuing the, or, or, um, for rescuing the lives of the casualties who are coming back. So there you are. Small, small pre-deployment team interaction whilst working in the challenging context. And can we make it reconfigurable so it's why it can be representative of a much wider range of MERT-type platforms? So, again, along with ISO 9241, observations at RAF Bryce Norton and RAF Odiham, and you can see some, that just goes through some of the things that we found here. Obviously, some of these are, are, are pretty obvious, but they need to be noted when it comes to the design of the VR. Very, very constrained environment, in, 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 incredible amounts of kit, not just medical kit, personal kit, weapons, you know, weapons that are armed or, or primed, rather, uh, all, with, in, 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 all forcing very limited movement of these teams, a minimum of three, and more like four to five per, 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 uh, per, per casualty um, around the, the, the stretched stretch individual. So there's a significant number of, of medical items and medical equipment, and it's a huge number of cables. IV lines and goodness knows what else uh, that they have to contend with as well. Has to take account of the design, the training would have to take account of the, the, the space or the lack of space, access and egress constraints, trip hazards, for example, posed by the, uh, by the existence of ammunition, imposed by the M60 machine gun, which is on the, the end of the ramp. Uh, all of these things will influence the ways in which these casualties are recovered and treated and then handed over when they get back to the main hospital base. Other personnel, it's not just the casualty in the medics, it's the quick reaction force, the young guys who spread out once the Chinook has landed and carry out point, point, de uh, point defense by, by, by sort of firing at terrorists and, and preventing them from actually causing further damage. It's the loadmaster. The loadmaster are uh, guys and gals who, again, very similar to the Shawbury project, are giving instructions not only to the crew, but also to the, the, uh, the, the medical team and the armed forces who are inside the back of that helicopter. External and internal environment conditions. Lighting, sound, vibration, dust, smell. Smell is important, not because of what you think, but because the one, the one smell that these guys always remember is aviation fuel. If you ever sit on a Chinook, you come out and your bum smells of aviation fuel. 
your clothes smell of aviation fuel. It's the one thing that re they remember from that experience. So do we take that into consideration? Or how far do we go, however, before this kind of thing might induce some kind of post-traumatic effect in those who have not had particularly good experiences on board the helicopters? And they were using some very, very old and very sad sim man, uh, sim man uh, mannequins as well. So unfortunately, the functionality of the ones that they had uh, was, was uh, indeed an issue in terms of the knowledge, skills, and abilities they were trying to train. So we had to look at how they, whether or not these should be replaced uh, either by static mannequins or functional mannequins in any, in any future, future design. So for the same human factors reasons we highlighted before, um, what we decided was that there was no way you could train these guys again by putting them into a virtual reality headset and giving them a, a, uh, giving them a hand controller or an Xbox controller to move around a virtual shooter. It simply wasn't going to work. So, concept design. Specifying user, re user requirements, but then to produce the design solutions to meet the user requirements. This is where it gets a little bit academic. Christmas, 2014. Steal grandson's crayons, drink two glasses of Shiraz, and come up with that. That's, the, that's, that's my academic input into this product, project. But we then took that, the whole idea was to produce an inflatable enclosure that roughly had dimensions of the internals of a Chinook from, in terms of width and height. Took that to a company called Imagine Inflatables, who do an awful lot of, obviously they do bouncy castles, but they also do inflatable work for the Ministry of Defense and Aerospace. Drew, drew up a design for this inflatable enclosure and then actually got it built. The Chinook itself was bought from the web. We, lent, we tend to use an awful lot of assets when we can because there's no point in building this if it exists and just requires a bit of remedial modeling. So www.turbosquid.com, buy the Chinook, and we can also buy a number of the characters. There aren't as many British Armed Forces characters online that you can use that are ready for animation as there are, for example, American, but nevertheless, there are a few. So we can buy these in and we can put them together to produce a, a relatively reasonable version of the inside of a Chinook. This is quite a bare looking Chinook. You've got the patient on the stretcher, uh, and you've got, on this one, it's in flight, but unfortunately there are no pilots, which is a bit frightening, but uh, things have moved on since then. The mannequin that we decided to go with was a trauma FX sim body, um, simply because we could reconfigure it to have things, for example, evisceration wounds caused by, uh, by machetes, bullet wounds, IED explosive uh, amputations and a wide, wide variety of things. Again, we're not trained them to do the skills to stop the bleeding or to carry out medical interventions. We need these to be relatively, uh, obviously, relatively relevant, if you like, to the, to the actual scene um, so that they're all working together on the same task but not actually doing that much in terms of hands on. So there's the original Mert simulator. Uh, is this, there's the picture of me I'm trying to. I'm not, I've tried to intubate this guy at least five times now, failed dismally on all occasions, I'm afraid to say. But you can see what we've got is this inflatable enclosure cluttered with all kinds of bits and pieces. Uh, two of my favorites are the minigun, which we got from www.mrminigun.com, and we had to get the, we had to get the support of the, uh, the police weapons specialist to get that through Heathrow. And the M60, which you can see just behind my back, we actually got... Um, on one of our trips down to Devon, we actually got for £135 from the Jolly Roger Emporium in Bobby Tracy, would you believe? So we, bought it, we, we, buy, we buy, steal, beg and borrow anything to make this thing cluttered, to give this feeling of confinement for the trainees. <laughs> so here, just a very, very couple, couple of seconds, um, just conscious of time, a couple of seconds of the original uh, headset, uh, sorry, the original um, headset and uh, Vive controller system being used. Make sure you have a look at the screen on the right and what's happening to the hands. Just keep an eye on that. Again, we, we, were, we were restricted to using the, the hand controls at the time because there was nothing else really on the market. Uh, I'll come up with that in a second. We also have, for example, we also input um, a very simple $10 model of a vital life science monitor and some free software from the web that enables the, the instructor to be able to configure the blood pressure, the SATs, the, uh, the heart rate on the screen and feed that through directly into the virtual life science monitor on board the Chinook. In-flight imagery, uh, again, we didn't have enough money or time to be able to build realistic external worlds, so what we did was we took one of our uh, DJI drones down to Dartmoor, um, the dreaded Fox Tormeyer, aka Grimpenmeyer, for all you, uh, all you um, Handle the Baskervilles fans, and we flew the drone backwards and then used it uh, to project it onto a billboard, so it's like a video screen back of the Chinook, which people can see, and again, it, it's a very cheap and cheerful way of doing it, but it is incredibly effective. Similarly, with the views of flying outside of the portals on the side of the, of the, of, of the uh, helicopter. Evaluations and modifications. So evaluating the design against the requirements. 
less than satisfactory. It was very, very bad. Some of you will have noticed those flickering hands. Some of you will notice the, the hands actually disappearing into the body. That was simply inappropriate. Even though we had the sim body un, kind of underneath the virtual view, the mismatch between your hands and that, and that physical sensation was simply unacceptable. So there you can see uh, my, my colleague Chang with the uh, HTC headset and the, and the HTC controllers. This is me, again, f dismally failing to, to intubate using um, one of three different kinds of commercially off-the-shelf gloves, which are, again, are neither used nor ornament. We did have a look at the new, the new breed of haptic feedback gloves, the Haptex and the VR Touch, neither of which, again, will work in this instance. They are, the, the Haptex is incredibly expensive, and basically it's a pneumatic system with an exoskeleton, which is going to interact badly with any other physical elements in the scene, and still they will not. Since I invented the world's first tactile feedback glove in 1992, would you believe, they still do not provide sufficient sensation for the hand or the arm or the fingertips to experience this real sense of touching a casualty and that casualties and, and that casualties uh, wounds uh, wounds and conditions. So this is where mixed reality comes in. Again, briefly, we're trying to augment the virtual with the real. We're trying to use the best of the real from training analysis to make the virtual more believable. So we started off with a simple blue screen approach. So here you can see Rob, my colleague in the right, he's wearing the HTC Vive, modified with a a 1080p uh, Zymia camera. It's a pass-through camera technique, so it's kind of augmented reality, but the system is detecting anything that's blue, and anything that's blue, it will superimpose the Chinook or the platform onto that. Anything else will appear as it does in reality. So here you see the mannequin, a little bit jerky in this. You see Rob's actual real hands. He's inside a virtual hovercraft, a real Royal Marines hovercraft, and he can reach out, and, he, and there's no correspondence problem. When he picks the, picks the guy up, he can actually interact with that guy and feel him as well as see him. It's a very, very powerful technique. We evaluated this with the Royal Air Force Tactical Medical Wing from Bryce Norton in May of this year using a full enclosure blue screen. Uh, very, very interesting results. Uh, we didn't get any issues with regard to the headsets or the tethers holding the headsets. There were more, compl there were more complaints about the quality of the sound. Um, but if you look at this video very briefly, you can see that even though these two guys are wearing headsets, modified headsets, they are exchanging items quite naturally. They are interacting really naturally. They are exchanging needles. And you know, we were absolutely gobsmacked to see that these guys fitted into the simulation really, really naturally. I didn't expect this. Uh, and again, we've, we, we've just written this up into a, into a, into a paper. We're, we're, we're producing, the, uh, presenting the results of the, um, the uh, usability studies and the levels of immersion, although I hate the word immersive, but the, but the levels of immersion and engagement these guys are experiencing using that particular technology. That's now led on to a new enclosure design to take advantage of the feedback we got from the tactical medical wing uh, ex ex experts. Much, lo much, much wider, sorry, much, much longer because we, we needed more space to move up and down, uh, move up and down the, uh, the, the cabin of the Chinook. Um, and uh, you can see there's the new delivery, it was delivered to us in June 2018, just about managed to get it into one of our tiny labs. And uh, here's, uh, we're still evaluating it now, there's still some teething problems with it. You can see, for example, the white, the white um, zips that bring the, uh, the back of the, uh, of, of the enclosure down, they're still obviously standing out like a sore thumb in terms of the inside of the Chinook helicopter. But things like the Bergens, any physical equipment that's not blue appears in its, in its rightful space. Uh, and it's, it's actually quite a, quite a convincing, convincing simulation. We've had that. We have had issues. A couple of weeks ago, we had the, we had the most the, the mother of all prolapses, as you can see here, which which was which, which was very very distressing. So we've had to have it re, we've had to have it renewed since then. But it has to, it has to the, term, the 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 the, uh, the test of time. We have had it, for example, here was a high clear actually inside a military tent, and that actually, that that, that um, worked, worked very well indeed. And finally, new stakeholders, because of course what I've said is this needs to be reconfigurable. It needs to be not just representative of a Chinook helicopter. So for example, we're now using it, we're now trying to develop this so that we can use it for different kind of armed forces, different, different armed forces platforms. The Mastiff, so on the right we have the real Mastiff, on the left we have the virtual Mastiff. Again, you can buy that vehicle off the web for maybe $150, $150. The, internals, the internal area, the internal scene we have to model ourselves. Uh, landing craft, uh, LCVP, that is used by the Royal Marines for casualty evacuation. Virtual images on the left, again, you can buy the vehicle on the top left-hand corner, but we have to build the internals. And we were using a very similar approach to 
generating outside views using, in this case, as you can see, uh, a GoPro mounted on the side of the landing craft. And also, you can make it open. So there's a Ricoh 360 camera mounted on the front, just on the front of the cabin, just behind the ramp. Um, we were capturing the information, we're capturing the view of the um, of the landing craft going forward. As, and this was taken just outside the breakwater uh, in Plymouth Sound. The uh, landing craft air cushion, the hovercraft, Ron Rings hovercraft, is seen here. We've had to build this using the computer design data supplied to us by the company in Southampton, both internal and external. And again, we've been able to use GoPro and Rico. You can just about make it, I think, the Rico camera probably can't top. Uh, bottom right hand corner in the top corner of the cockpit there. Uh, so that's, uh, that, and, and also you can see the view from the Rico here, the Rico camera. And the great thing about this is because it's 360, you can also use this as training material by putting it into something like the Oculus Go or one of these new standalone virtual reality headsets and showing individuals the experience of being on these vehicles even before they've, they've, they've had their, their, their first experience. Instructors, the instructor station has been uh, refined and developed uh, particularly for after action review. Uh, where we've now got this Samsung panoramic screen. Uh, we're now using the, uh, uh, the virtual reality model that we built ourselves, again using company CAD data with permission of the new Tempus Vital Life Science Monitor. The avatars are we're, we're gradually increasing the complement inside the, the helicopter and the other platforms by using motion capture. We've got a, um, we've got a, 12, a 12 camera OptiTrack system uh, that we use for some of our augmented reality, mixed reality work. And uh, bottom right-hand corner, or bottom left-hand left corner, is uh, Wendy. This is some, one of my research fellows' wives. The reason we use Wendy, bless her, is that uh, none of those fatties can actually fit into the suit um, that we bought with this motion capture system. She's the only person that the suit will fit. So she, she comes in, and we, we, we buy her noodles and, 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 and give her treats and things. And, she, and she, then she takes on the role of the minigunner or the pilot and what have you. She's very, very good, I have to say. And you can see the, uh, the output of some of the work there. So we've got the, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the minigunner. Again, they have to be animated, but not to any extreme, extreme, um, extreme uh, lim limit because what we're after are simple background actions that, that improve the believability of the context. We don't want anything to distract these guys where they're performing their task, but we don't want them to think, oh, I'm surrounded by some 3D models of humans that are doing nothing. So... To conclude, what's next? Um, we're now moving into uh, modeling new, anima, new avatars with the force protection and, as, and a second medical team carrying out operation on a second virtual, uh, ma virtual mannequin. Uh, we're looking into vibration effects, bottom right-hand corner. There's a, piece, there's a device underneath. Um, we call him Steve the Stiff, by the way. Under Steve the Stiff stretcher, there's a device there called a butt kicker. And this is something that you can buy for gaming to put on the your seat, which makes your seat vibrate when you open fire with a machine gun. It's actually not bad. It, it kind of vibrates because we're, we're not going to have this thing ever have this thing on a motion base because that would just put the price of it completely through the roof. And the jury's still out as to whether or not motion bases add anything significant in terms of part class training. So we've got new, uh, new uh, video recordings from Chinook and from the, ho and from the, the hovercraft are going, to be, uh, are going to be produced. And we're going to be looking at uh, new platforms and platforms of opportunity. Because in the future, Chinooks may not be available. You may have to do this in the back of a twin-engine otter. Development of specific, specific interventions, again, not from a clinical training perspective, but to make sure that mannequin is appropriate for the kind of, de uh, the kind of wounds that these guys will need to be interacting with as a small team. Further development of the instructor's console, uh, particularly, for, particularly for after action review and briefing the trainees after they've been in. Uh, we're also including eye tracking. You can see in the middle, the bottom, the, the new, um, new uh, A-glass eye tracking devices that you can fit into the HTC Vive headsets. So we're going to be able to look at where these guys are focusing. Um, for example, do they notice any changes on the Vital Life Science Monitor? Are they paying attention to the load master who's telling them they've got three minutes in order to uh, get ready to, 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 deliver the, uh, to deliver the casualty? Uh, into the um, in, in, into the, uh, the hospital, the, the forward the forward operating base. Just a couple of examples there of being able to do other things like night vision, getting brown out, actually dust coming into the dust incursion incursion into the Chinook itself, and then very finally, um, we're extending this now. We're now looking into the use of this for training chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear CBRN training uh, with some of our with some of our colleagues um, some of our colleagues in Winterbourne Gunner. We're looking at, with the Royal Navy, at possibly extending this to simulate the, cl the, the cl clinic that's on board the Queen Elizabeth, um, Queen Elizabeth, uh, hover, uh, not hovercraft, Queen Elizabeth uh, aircraft carrier. And we're talking to a number of air ambulance uh, individuals, including the Sick Children's Air Ambulance, to look at how we can take this experience and modify it into an existing AW169. 
So the recipe for success, I would argue, well, there's some really good fun stuff going on here, but it's all tempered by the need to make sure that whatever you produce is fit for purpose. It's no good us putting these guys in headsets if they, can, if they can't wear them, if it makes them feel sick, if it produces strain on their neck. We have to, at every stage of the introduction of new technologies, new concepts, carry out evaluations with subject matter experts to make sure that what we deliver is going to be fit for purpose. And hopefully, we'll help these guys train in a much more effective and much, much more realistic way than they've, been, than they've done before. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much. Where's Bryn? Bryn? On time. It's actually one minute early. <laughs> no.